Lord, thank you for the privilege of coming into your presence and for the promise that you make that when two or three are gathered together in my name there, I will be in the midst of them. So, Lord, we thank you that we can be here, but more importantly, we thank you that you are here. We ask that you would open up our hearts and our minds to your presence, that you would work in us that which you desire. And so we say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. We yield to you. And we thank you that we are yours. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated. As most of you probably know, uh, I was here for the 9.30, sir, 9 o'clock service. Now, the 9 o'clock service is very interactive. I can ask them questions and they answer. I'd like to do the same with us, if that's okay. So please feel free to speak out loud if I say something. Don't be embarrassed or feel like that's inappropriate. This, this is one of those spots where the bishop can sort of do whatever he wants. So I'm doing it. Okay, so first thing. There are a couple of things I want to show you. They're objects. And the first thing I want to show you is this. What's this? Ah, uh, generational difference. At the, nine thir at the 9 o'clock service, they said, oh, that's an iPhone. And I said, boy, you even know what kind it is. You're on it. But this fact that I own this and that any of us who own these phones or some kind, whether you are an iPhone person, or whether you are an Android person, or where you are, whether you are what's called a simple feature phone person. <laughs> what my wife calls a stupid phone, because <laughs> she has one. She says, I don't want to mess with this. All of this says something about who you are. Um, but this says about me is, number one, I really want to be connected to people. I need to have, act, people need to have access to me and me to them. And so I get texts, I get telephone calls, I get emails, all of which, see, I can access. It's sort of like a walking office. And of course, the system, the media system, wants you to be as connected as possible. So there is texting, there is Twitter, there are emails. There is Snapchat shot. There is Snapchat. There is Flickr. There is a whole list of ways that if you want to be connected to people, Instagram, you can do it. And it's all here. But this says something, you see, about who I am. It's more than an object that I use in this day and age. This is actually a kind of identity marker, is it not? Um, when they announced the iPhone 6 this week, it was a national media event. Now that says something, doesn't it? Yeah. Believe me. I don't know whether it's good or not, but it says something about us. So anyhow, that's the cell phone. Now I want to show you this. What's that? It's a cross. Uh, it's a cross that actually means quite a lot to me because it was given to me by the canon to the ordinary in the Diocese of Egypt. And I carry it and hold it, and this is shaped, if you can see, it's kind of a funny looking shape, because it's actually meant to be held in the palm of your hand. So it cradles, as it were, inside your palm. And it means something to me because it reminds me of the plight that Christians suffer in the Middle East. And of course, that's made a lot of headlines recently because of ISIS and the things that are going on in Syria. But as anybody who studied the subject will tell you, it's certainly not limited to the Middle East. You could be talking about North Korea. You could be talking about a lot of countries in and around the globe where believing Christians are persecuted specifically because they are, in fact, Christians. So this is a hot issue and one, quite honestly, that we Christians who do not suffer, suffer this kind of persecution ought to be concerned. It behooves us, particularly those of us who are a part of this global Anglican communion, to be able to say, we have fellow Anglicans, brothers and sisters in Christ, 
who are in fact dying because they have made that commitment to say, what? I belong to Jesus. And I belong to Jesus more than I belong to the state, more than I belong to a government, more than I belong even to a tribe. I first and foremost belong to Jesus. And they are willing to pay the price for that very clear identity. And you see, whether you actually wear a cross or not, if you're a Christian, the same is true for you. You, in fact, belong to Jesus. It's not a, merely a religious affiliation. It's not merely a set of beliefs to which you hold. It is, in fact, a new understanding of ownership and who owns you. I don't know whether you've thought about being a Christian in that or light or not, but it's consistent through the entire New Testament. And we sum it up in the baptism service. Remember, after the baby or the adult has gotten wet, the presider comes and takes a little oil and puts it on his or her thumb and says these words, you are sealed. Can you say it with me? Do you know it? You are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Meaning what? He owns you. He owns you. I think it's worth letting that sink in. It should, in fact, be a source of incredible comfort. I mean, if you noticed... In the epistle lesson, what Paul said in the book of Romans, chapter 14, one of the lines, if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord, so that whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. That's one of the lines in the funeral service. And it's meant to bring comfort that what happens when a Christian dies, he or she doesn't kind of go into an abyss, nothingness. Instead, that Christian is literally cradled through the very gate of death, into the arms of God's everlasting mercy. We are owned by him. And he promises never to leave us or forsake us. And that, in fact, nothing can take us out of his hand. That's the comfort of ownership. I belong to Jesus. I am his. I have to tell you, for me, it's the most precious thing in the world. But with that sense of ownership, there's also a call. I'm not free, in other words, because I am owned, to determine my own destiny, to organize my own behavior, to make decisions about how I live. I'm, in fact, accountable to God, the one who you see owns me, to live my life in a certain manner. And that's why all of the lessons this morning, especially Romans and Matthew, deal specifically with the issue of behavior for those who are owned. We are the Lord's, you see. And the real thing that I want to hone in on, there's a lot, and I'm not gonna, we're not going to do a two-hour lecture, I promise. I want to hone in on one lesson, and that's the Matthew lesson, the gospel reading for this morning. The issue has to do with forgiveness. I want to tell you, probably one of the hardest things that's asked of us as Christians. I want you to know that when I talk about forgiveness, I'm very clear about the fact that we're not dealing with something that is easy. And anyone who is engaged at any level with human suffering, whether it be by personal experience or whether it be by affiliation and association with others, know that this is not a light subject. We're talking about depths here that are very, very difficult to plummet. Uh, we're, and so I want you to know that I'm not operating in this area out of a sense of naivety or a lack of realism, but also to go back to those, the one who gave me this cross and the plight of the persecuted I've learned more from them about the nature of forgiveness than I could have never have known otherwise. Because you see, the call to forgive really does go across the board. 
And if it does not work in the most extreme of situations where forgiveness is asked of us by the one who owns us, then at that point, it actually doesn't work at all. We're not talking about forgiveness at that point. We're just talking about trying to be nice people. I'm not talking about trying to be nice people. <laughs> I'm talking about something deeper, richer, more profound, and more eternally important. Because Jesus in the parable makes this a matter in a very clear way of eternal importance. What you do really does have an impact on your relationship with your Heavenly Father. So this is not just tangentially, it is critically important. So what I want to do is walk briefly through the parable to talk about this. And this is in fact a kind of in-house conversation among those who understand that they are owned by Christ. You need to know if the world looks at this thing, goes, that's the silliest, in fact, perhaps even one of the most dangerous things I've ever heard of. It does not make sense to forgive those who have harmed you. It really actually doesn't. It only makes sense when we know that we live under the one who has forgiven us ever. If we understand that, that's a different playing field. And that's the playing field that I want to talk about. Because that's how the parable is. Here's this, you know, Jesus, Peter, how many times do I forgive? Seven times, because you see, that was, in fact, the rabbinical rule. You could actually keep a list. And once you'd hit seven, you could say, with rabbinical authority, as a friend of mine said, and that's, well, she really wasn't a friend. <laughs> she said, I don't have time for these people. I mean, that's sort of the 21st century version of putting somebody in prison. If you remember the parable. Write them off. They're not there anymore. I don't have to deal with them. Do you know people who do that? I do. Nod your head. Come on, we're in this together. <laughs> it may be us. <laughs> and so, when Jesus says, not just seven, but 77 times, what he's clearly doing is that he's sort of opening the door into infinity. He's not just sort of saying, when you get to 69, you can go, okay, I'm almost done. <laughs> Instead, it really is an open invitation, and more than an invitation, a call to live out of a place of forgiveness that quite honestly is supernatural. We began the service from the colic saying, oh God, without you, we are not able to please you. And if there's any place where the reality of that phrase hits, it's right here in this call to forgive. <laughs> I can't do it, God. May that your Holy Spirit direct and rule our hearts becomes the cry, not just a simple liturgical prayer, but the cry of those who are willing to enter into this deep sea called forgiving. So let's go. I'm about to jump in. Parable, really quickly. Jesus tells the story, there's a ruler. He's given lots of money to a lot of people, and he's got, in essence, his head guy, to whom he has entrusted millions in our When you say 10,000 talents, that's an astronomical number. That's like winning $150 million in the lottery. It's sort of beyond comprehension. So he calls the man and says, you know, you've been... Wheeling and dealing, but you haven't paid me back. Pay me back. Otherwise, I may have to do something about it. The man falls on his knees and he says, please give me more time. I, I can't just, you know, I can't get it together to be able to do this. And what happens? And probably to the astonishment of all of those who were listening to this conversation, he not only gives you more time, more than that, he cancels the multi-billion dollar debt. I mean, I know that when Jesus is telling this story, the people in the audience go, oh. I mean, it's that kind of shocking level of cancellation that's happened. Now, there's a direct parallel, Jesus makes it, between the way the owner operates and the way your heavenly father, Jesus speaking of God, also operates. In other words, the point where we begin in this story is that, in fact, as it relates to who we are in the story and who the owner is, the owner is God, and we're the devil. 
one of the keys, one of the probably the most important key to forgiveness has everything to do that we live as debtors to the forgiveness of God. And that multi-billion dollar cancellation is actually what Jesus did on the cross. Canceling the debt is actually Paul's words for it. Meaning, not the debt of monetary, but the debt of sin. God forgiving us. Knowing that I, I, even though I owe him, gosh, so much because of all of my failings, the fact of the matter is, he wipes the slate clean. That I look forward to the day when I stand, what? Before the judgment seat? That's also in the parable this morning. And hear from him, not because I did such a hot job, believe me. Good and faithful servant. Am I owed that by no one? No one. But it's God's choice to forgive me. So we're the person for whom all of that debt has been canceled. So the man's clean. He goes, what does he do? He finds one of his fellow slave owners, slaves who owes him about maybe three months worth of wages. And what does he do? It's very graphic. He grabs him by the throat. Pay me right now. And the man, and the, the parallel is intentional, pleads with forgiveness and for time using the very same language. The vocabulary is identical that, he does, that the man did before the other. And of course, what does that guy do? Ah, throws him into prison. That gives him the capacity, you see, to confiscate all of his goods, which meant his family would have been penniless. It's a cruel thing. <coughs> well, of course, when the slaves found out about it, they were outraged, and they went straight to the owner. I've got to tell you what happened over here. And, of course, the owner is furious. And so he calls in the guy and said, I literally forgave you something that you could have never, ever repaid in your lifetime. And yet, for that little piddly thing that he owed you, you're willing to throw the man into prison? I guess you go to prison too, don't you? And that's what happens. So will my heavenly Father deal with you if you do not forgive them from your heart is the last line. It's chilling. I didn't write it. Jesus told this story. So we've got to deal with it. Which means, I need God here to help me extend the forgiveness that I have received. Do you hear me? I need God to help me extend the forgiveness that I have received. I'm not asking to give me something that he hasn't already given me, which is the cancellation of all debt, entry into eternal life, God's favor, lo, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I mean, the promises are astronomical. They are extravagant. They are without comparison. No one could give me what God has given me. No one can give you what God has given you. No one. So, God, I need your help to be a channel for that kind of forgiveness. <laughs> That's why we're not talking about just being nice. We're talking about something that is supernatural, that God has to work in us. And the joy of it is, the glory of it is, is that he can do it. It happens. <coughs> I'm in northern Uganda. I'm in a camp that's called a displaced persons camp. These are people who are victims of a paramilitary occult organization called the Lord's Resistance Army. They have marauded, raped, pillaged. They are now in the protection of the government in a camp that you and I would think of as squalor because that's exactly what it was. And yet, when I met with those Christians, the serenity on their faces, the joy in their eyes, 
taught me more about forgiveness than anything I ever could have known. It is, in fact, supernaturally possible for this to happen. Naturally, no. Here's the story. If this is what we wear, that means what we don't wear is this. We do not wear a fist around our neck. The fist is revenge. The fist is, I get to get back at you. The fist says, even if I can't act it out, I will never let you in again. <clears throat> the cross says, I forgive. Now when we're talking about violence, forgiveness doesn't mean you get to do it again. But it does mean I forgive you for what you have done. It's an important distinction, particularly when you're talking about domestic violence, when you're talking about people who have been battered. Forgiveness doesn't mean I just get to get be beat up all the time. No. We do need to act and get people out of situations like that. We need to find a way to be a protection for one another. But a part of the way that we extend that protection for one another is to create amongst ourselves a capacity and a relationship that says, no matter where you've been or what you've done, we forgive you and we welcome you. And we choose, even in the midst of violence, to be a people who choose to forgive. And that is exactly what this obligates us to. It obligates us. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. You're in. <laughs> Whether you were told that or not, you are in. So family, family of God, in the midst of a culture that is marked by revenge and retaliation, in the midst of a culture that does not know how to let go of resentment, to a, in the midst of a culture that celebrates the possibility of getting even, God calls us to something different. It's a welcome that has legs. It's a welcome that says we will stand beside you. It is a welcome that says that we forgive. It is a welcome that says we support each other so that no matter what you have been through, we will stand with you and walk you through this very call to forgive and to let go of the hurt and to stand with the people who accept you and love you. That's what this means. Because I can't do it on my own. Not only actually do I need him, but I need you to do this. Because all of us from time to time will want to do this. It's part of who we are. We need people who will help us to take that fist down and remind us again of whose we are. And his promise that says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And nothing can take you out of my hand. That we might learn to live to love, and to forgive together. Amen. Amen.